I'm going to start with talking about COVID in general as an acute illness and how it manifests both systemically, pulmonary, and in the heart. And then Dr. Kelly Hedgepath is going to talk about risk factors and recommendations for our cardiac patients and spe special considerations for all of you. And then Dr. Bilchik is going to talk about lessons and vulnerabilities and more generally about the pandemic. So COVID is a viral illness caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that enters the body primarily through the respiratory tract. And about 80% of people will have a mild form. Now, for any of you who've had it, and I know some of you who have, uh, it doesn't feel mild. But what I mean by mild is it's not life-threatening in the early stage. People can generally be at home, and they may feel really, really crummy for weeks and weeks, even sometimes months, but it's not life-threatening. And this is what we call the viral stage. And when left to its own devices, for the most part, most host immune systems, meaning the person who has it, are able to fight off the virus. So it feels like a flu for the most part, lots of muscle aches, fevers, various symptoms that we'll talk a little bit more about, but it is fought off by the virus as long as your immune system is healthy to do that. Unfortunately, about 20% of people progress to stage two, which is really the COVID pneumonia that you've heard about, where it's still in the lung. Sometimes the oxygen levels drop and people can have a spectrum of how sick they are. There's very little systemic full body illness in stage two. And sadly, about 5% of people will go on to a really severe stage three illness where it's throughout the body. And not only is this now a systemic problem that can affect every organ in your body, but it actually incites a host immune response, meaning the person fighting it off, the immune system is so vigorous and so overly enthusiastic that the immune response becomes part of the problem. And it's in stage three that you may have heard that we sometimes use medicines that actually suppress your immune system, like dexamethasone, which is a type of a steroid. It's also in stage three that we often see the cardiac complications. So this slide looks really busy and I'm gonna walk you through it because this slide kind of says everything that I need to tell you about COVID. So starting with this black wavy line here, this is the severity of disease over time. And starting in stage one, which is viral response phase, again, where about 80% of people will recover, you might have a low grade fever, a cough, loss of smell, muscle aches, Blood tests are typically pretty normal, but the white blood cells may actually drop down. And in this phase, most people don't need any medication at all. There is a medicine called remdesivir, which fights against the virus and helps your immune system fight the virus. Some people use remdesivir in the early stage, but for the most part in stage one, it's what we call supportive care. Make sure you're hydrated, make sure you're getting enough rest, make sure your oxygen levels are good and you monitor your symptoms really closely. For the 20% or so that progress on to stage two, they don't recover, but they keep getting sicker. That's primarily the lung phase, the pneumonia phase. And in stage two, the oxygen levels sometimes drop. People primarily feel short of breath. They may have a cough that gets worse. An X-ray of the chest at this point may show what we call infiltrates, which is fluffy fluids in the lungs that indicate a pneumonia going on. And sometimes we start to see the liver enzymes getting involved as well. In stage two, usually that medicine I talked about called remdesivir is useful and appropriate. And often in stage two, people need to be hospitalized and monitored really closely. Because as I said, about 5% of patients will then progress to stage three and we call stage three the hyperinflammation phase. And this is the phase where the immune system starts to overreact. And instead of doing its job appropriately, it's doing too much of a job and it's secreting all sorts of chemicals that actually make you sicker. And the lungs tend to fill up with fluid, the blood pressure may drop, the body has a tendency to form blood clots, and there's inflammation in pretty much every organ, including the kidneys, respond to that inflammation. If you check blood tests here, you may have heard of a blood test called troponin, which is an enzyme released by the heart when it's under stress. That's typically up in stage three, with or without actual heart involvement. It's just the heart is so stressed by this illness. 
the BNP, which is a blood test that shows elevated pressure in the heart, which we sometimes see in congestive heart failure, is also typically elevated in this, as well as all the inflammation markers that you may have heard of like CRP, ferritin, ESR. So stage three is a very severe disease and there's a very high mortality when people get to stage three. They're always in the hospital for stage three and often intubated on respiratory support. It's in stage three that suppressing the immune system may actually make people better. And that's when we consider the use of steroids like dexamethasone. For sure, we also consider the use of remdesivir there. Um, and there's a lot of experimental trials going on looking at other tests that suppress different aspects of the immune system and transfusing plasma from people who have recovered from COVID who have antibodies. So lots of experimental data going on in stage three, but all we know for sure right now is oxygen is almost always necessary, supporting blood pressure, and then considering steroids. Okay. So chest pain, when patients with COVID get chest pain, we always think about the pneumonia itself, which can cause pleurisy and discomfort in the lungs, which is felt as a chest pain. But as cardiologists, we always worry, could there also be a heart involvement? And I mentioned the inflammation of the heart, which I'm gonna to get to, but we also see just worsening of underlying heart conditions. So people who have blocked arteries to begin with are at higher risk for having heart attacks due to blood clots forming in the heart arteries and cutting off blood supply to the heart muscle. And they're also at risk for what we call supply demand mismatch, which may be that the heart arteries had a 60, 70% blockage for years that was never causing a problem, but in the setting of pneumonia and low oxygen and fever and fluctuations in blood pressure, it puts so much stress on the heart that you have a type of a heart attack due to excessive demand on the heart. When inflammation attacks the heart muscle, that's something called myocarditis. Myo means muscle, card means heart, itis means inflammation. And myocarditis can occur from lots of different things, including different kinds of virus, viruses, including COVID, including bacterial infections. But when you get inflammation of the heart muscle from COVID, it's due to that virus itself and or due to the host's immune system causing that inflammation. And that can make the heart very weak it can make abnormal heart rhythms, and it can cause congestive heart failure. Other things to think about are blood clots like pulmonary embolism and gastrointestinal problems. So usually in those cases, we need to do not just the blood test, which I told you can be not very specific for heart troubles, but echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, can allow us to see how is the heart squeezing? Is there an area of the heart that's scarred or weaker than another? So, Patients who come in with COVID who develop chest pain, we need to think about a lot of different things in addition to just the pneumonia itself. COVID can also obviously cause shortness of breath. And again, while it's usually due to pneumonia, we also still have to think about heart causes of shortness of breath. And so in COVID, we can see congestive heart failure, which means that the lungs are filling with fluid, either because the heart is not squeezing strongly or because the heart is squeezing well, but it's not relaxing normally. So it's what we call diastolic failure. So heart failure comes in two flavors. With or without COVID, heart failure comes in two flavors. Yeah. Failure, meaning it doesn't squeeze well, it's weak. And diastolic failure, meaning it squeezes well, but it relaxes very stiffly. And that causes fluid to build up in the lungs because as the fluid tries to enter from the lungs into the heart, it's meeting resistance. So shortness of breath, we think about coronary artery disease, weak heart, inflammation, responding to this systemic immune over response, and we think about the pneumonia as well. So just to summarize my clinical overview, the three stages of disease in COVID are the early viral stage, which most people recover from, about 80%. The uh, lung phase, which is the moderate phase, and then the hyperinflammation phase. And when people get that hyperinflammation phase, we think about suppressing the immune system. But just we've heard questions about in stage one or prophylactically, preventively, should people take steroids? No, the steroids are to suppress the immune system. 
only if you get to that late stage. If you take steroids early on, you're gonna suppress your good immune system, which is trying to fight off the virus. So early on, we don't wanna suppress your immune system with steroids. Early on, we wanna boost your immune system, sleep, rest, monitoring. And then later, if you're that unlucky few that go on to that severe phase, that's when we use the steroids to suppress the immune system. Chest pain, shortness of breath can be due to the COVID itself, but we also have to remember to think broadly that other things can happen in the setting of COVID that involve the heart with inflammation, with blood clots, and with worsening of underlying problems. So that's my piece. I'm gonna pass on to Dr. Kelly Hedgepath, and thank you, and we can take, as I said, questions at the end. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee Lewis. I'm gonna share my screen. As um, I'm getting set up, I saw in the chat there was a question about uh, plasma transfusion in the treatment. So I didn't know if maybe you wanted to comment on that, um, or I can. I think there's so much that we don't know. Yes. So, we, yeah, why don't we can maybe save the questions. I'm going to write all these questions down. Um, most of the answer is going to be the same for all these, which is we don't know yet. It's being studied, some promising data, but no definitive answers yet. So that's the answer to the, the plasma transfusion. So um, there's so much um, about this virus that we're really learning real time. Um, and from a science aspect, um, much of the current science, um, I think, has slowed down and really has just been focusing worldwide on response to the COVID-19 infection. So I wanna share with you some of the data that we have and uh, the data that we have is growing really exponentially on a daily basis. And some of the problem of that is that um, the new data has really overwhelmed the typical systems that we have in place um, of checks and balances to make sure that when we are publishing scientific data that um, the results have really been rigorously analyzed and we're pretty certain of the conclusions that we draw. At any point when you really change the process, there's always risk to have um, kind of false uh, results. And I just put that out there because there's so much that we don't know. And uh, three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, I hope that we have a lot more answers um, to the questions um, than we do today. But I think the big question for everybody is who's at risk and how do I decrease my risk? And what has been true, unfortunately, in study after study is that age is the strongest predictor of having a severe illness. That does not mean that if you're older, you will have a severe illness. It just means that um, our children and our young adults are much less likely to have a severe illness that requires hospitalization. So there is some good news uh, to that um, because I think our kids are spared. Um, there are certainly a number of scientific questions that we're asking regarding why um, does age really um, uh, result in a higher risk? And hopefully over the next months, I'll have better um, answer to that question. Um, this is a list that's on the CD, uh, CDC website that looks at who is at risk. So age is at the top. Um, we also think that um, patients with heart conditions that have had blockages, heart failure, weakened heart muscle, all are, are also at risk. Those with chronic kidney disease, those with COPD or chronic lung disease, uh, obesity, sickle cell disease, uh, as well as those with type 2 diabetes. And I could postulate ideas for all of these, but I think at this point, it's a little early for us really to draw scientific conclusions from that. Um, sorry. Um, okay, that is not what I intended to do. Sorry about that. Oh, and now I'm playing. 
Okay. Um, I have uh, failed, sorry, in terms of my technology challenge. There we go. Okay. So uh, this is a slide that is just showing what I told you that age is the biggest predictor of having a severe infection. This is US data that looks at the prevalence of hospitalization by age. So you can see in our young and our um, children, there's really a very low prevalence of being hospitalized with disease. That risk of being hospitalized really goes up as we get older. So 65 is really the cutoff that we say 65 and older is at increased risk for severe illness. And unfortunately, um, we also see a high rate of um, severe complications, including death, uh, as we age. Um, the good news is, is that we have demonstrated um, that we can decrease exposures by um, maintaining social distance. So this is really um, the best option, that old adage that our um, best offense is a good defense is really true here, okay? So as the world starts to open up, I think if, if we are dealing with a high risk uh, group, especially based on age, we have to really maintain our vigilance. So maintain social distancing, continue to wash your hands, disinfect surfaces, and certainly wear a face mask if you can't social distance. We've had a number of questions regarding the R naught of the COVID-19. So that's how infectious it really is. So as Dr. Lee Lewis said, um, it's a respiratory infection that's really spread through airborne droplets um, or microparticles. Um, when we look at how many people get infected, um, uh, there's about two to three for COVID-19 and that's shown here. This is slightly more infectious than the seasonal flu, where that has an R naught of one to two people, but thankfully less infectious than SARS, which we were our initial estimates where we thought we might be seeing uh, four or five people infected for every infected patient, and certainly much less than some other infectious diseases. Uh, measles has one of the highest R naught, where 15 to 16 people are infected for every infected person. So. Um, but because we're dealing with an R naught of two to three, that's why we do see this exponential rise um, when exposed people are out and about. So again, um, maintaining social distance and precaution is really imperative. And I just show this graphic, which I'm sure everybody in the office, uh, in the audience has seen. Um, this is from the New York Times uh, yesterday that shows the red is um, the exponential increase in the hotspots that we're seeing across the nation. And that's obviously giving us some concern. Thankfully, Massachusetts is in the blue where we've seen a decline even this past week in new cases. And New England in general has done a very good job of maintaining um, a decline after we had our peak um, about um, four to six weeks ago now. There's a lot of unknowns here. As the country is heating up and um, there are more people traveling that in the upcoming weeks and months, we're just not sure how that's going to affect um, our local rates. So we're hopeful that those rates stay low. And I just want to go back to this list of who's at risk. But if we think you're at risk just based on how old you are or some of your comorbidities, I really um, implore you just to be wise and continue to uh, maintain your social distance. This is a list of comorbidities that might put you at higher risk. And this is where um, understanding the science is really important because this is a really long laundry list. And I have to say, at this point, we're kind of guesstimating if you see something on this list that you have, how that affects um, your immune system. We really don't know. And because 
so quickly. There are some studies that say this is at high risk and other studies that show this is not a, a risk factor. So this is really a gray area. Um, so hopefully over the next six months, we will have much better predictive tools that actually allow us to say, we understand some of this pathophysiology and we, um, and we understand some risk factors so we can even use a tool um, such as a risk factor calculator to further risk stratify people. But at this point, we're really in our infancy of understanding the science and some of it is just guesstimation. Um, what we have seen, unfortunately, since the pandemic has really affected the world, is that people are using emergency medical services and emergency room at hospitals much different than they have in the past. Um, and especially early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of fear. If I don't feel well, I don't want to go to the emergency room. And the great news is, is that we really now have protocols in place. Um, we have proper um, protective equipment um, and uh, PPE available to healthcare workers and uh, really good protocols for every level of medical staff um, in the medical community. So we don't want people to be staying at home if they need emergency medical care. Um, this is the title of a paper that was recently published looking at data in Northern Italy, which of course was one of the big hotspots hit early on by the pandemic. The title of this paper is COVID Kills at Home. And so what these researchers did is they looked at the um, number of cardiac deaths at home from February until May of this year and compared it retrospectively to data from last year and unfortunately saw a 53% increase in home deaths. Um, there could be some confounding there and some of these patients may have had a viral illness, we don't know, but it does seem that people are utilizing the emergency medical system differently. So because of that, in this country, we've really launched a public awareness campaign. So this is um, a color graphic by the American Heart Association um, and the American College of Cardiology that really just wants to get the word out to all patients. If you're having acute symptoms, please call 911, come in and be assessed. So those symptoms of acute onset of chest pain, shortness of breath, I can't breathe, are symptoms um, potentially of a heart attack. Um, symptoms of an acute stroke would be difficulty speaking, numbness um, on either part of your face or part of your body, um, loss of vision or difficulty balancing. Those are situations where that's a medical emergency um, and we would advise everybody to call 911 and not have any worries about your exposure risk coming into the hospital. Um, we also would like patients to um, continue to take their regular medications because there is a question of whether some of these comorbidities of heart disease, hypertension, diabetes puts you at higher risk. We really want everyone to be proactive um, uh, and be compliant with your regimen and, and do your best to optimize um, the things that we can. In regard to patients with high blood pressure, we've been receiving a number of questions about specific classes of antihypertensive medications. So one of the most broadest or the widely uh, used medications are classes of medications called ACE inhibitors uh, and angiotensin receptor blockers. Those are ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Um, it turns out that these affect um, a hormonal pathway um, and is, their uh, actions in the body are really complex. Um, however, they really, for cardiac patients, been shown uh, to have positive effects and stabilize disease. Um, there's been mixed data looking at the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, which shares the name with the medication. Um, and, but the COVID-19 virus actually uses this receptor to enter our cells in, the, in our body when we're exposed to the virus. And there's been mixed data from some animal studies versus human studies as to whether 
these commonly prescribed medications actually predispose us to getting the infection. So early on, uh, a lot of people were really stopping their medications or choosing um, not to take pills or calling and ask to be on other medications. Um, we've worked really hard the last few months to get the word out so if you're asking us if you should take these take these medications the answer is absolutely yes and i want to share with you a little bit of the data um, because um, the cardiology division has felt so strongly about this they did release a statement early in the pandemic in march and this is a joint statement from the acc the aha and the heart failure society really advising uh, patients not to become their own physician and stop medications and that we really did not have evidence that these medications at all uh, changed outcomes um, and in fact some of the more recent publications that looked at um, patients with high blood pressure who had, were admitted to China at the onset of the pandemic and looked at mortality outcomes, um, there was a trend to even doing better if patients were treated with these medications. So we don't think that taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB um, is associated with having a severe reaction um, to a COVID infection, and it potentially is beneficial. But again, it's early in um, us understanding the pathophysiology, um, and there probably will be more to come in understanding this in the future, but for now, people should really stay on their medications. Um, we also want to remind everybody um, that cold and flu season is coming this fall, and the weather's nice and hot now, and everyone's outdoors, um, and I think celebrating some uh, freedom from our lockdown in the spring. Um, but soon enough, the weather is going to be cold again, and we're going to be indoors again. And there is a big question how that shift in how we're living will affect the COVID-19 rates in the state and in the nation. Um, but certainly, uh, we don't want to risk the chance of having an infection with the seasonal flu in addition to COVID-19. So um, we advise everybody to be up to date on your vaccinations. And when the seasonal flu vaccine is available this fall, we encourage everybody um, to make sure that you're vaccinated early. Um, I want to say a few other things about keeping up healthy habits, because really, uh, these are the best ways that we can prime our immune system. And from the slides that Dr. Lee Lewis showed, we know that how important having a robust immune response is um, not to having a severe case of um, COVID-19. So the things that we commonly recommend to all of our cardiac patients include eating a healthy diet, getting enough sleep, managing stress, and exercising regularly. Um, a healthy diet is really one of the um, most simple ways that we can treat our cardiac disease. It has direct uh, daily uh, effects on your blood glucose, your blood pressure, uh, your insulin sensitivity, um, and levels of inflammation. So um, maintaining um, those healthy habits, um, despite the fact that we're all tired of cooking and um, sometimes fast food options uh, do seem easy. Um, it, it's, it's really a nice reminder for all of us that, um, that those uh, really simple building blocks of our, our habitual daily um, healthy diet is really key to our immune system. Likewise, we like to encourage everyone to continue with their regular exercise regimen. If you don't have a regular exercise regimen, this is also a great time uh, to really uh, think about building uh, a weekly routine and, and thinking about um, how, how you could really modify your day-to-day your -day activity over the next few weeks. Exercise, of course, also affects your insulin sensitivity, your baseline inflammation, your blood glucose, and also provides a mental health benefit. So exercise for a number of reasons is really great. Um, just as a quick reminder for all of our cardiac patients, we recommend exercising at moderate intensity for 30 minutes, five days a week. If you exercise at a higher rate, you can get away with a few less minutes. And then we also recommend two additional days of strength training on top of that. So um, hopefully this encourages everybody to stay in their routine. Um, this is a slide um, that I just wanna briefly show 
everyone, because as we're thinking about the possibility of being exposed to this infection, we're all kind of facing um, a, a risk of being sick or scared. Um, the data that we have, um, not related to the infection, but just related in terms of mortality from cardiovascular disease, um, really highlight the importance of choosing these inf um, these lifestyle strategies. So the more you eat a healthy diet, get adequate sleep and exercise, all those things are additive on each other. So the more you do, uh, the lower your risk of cardiovascular death. So I just say that out loud because sometimes these lifestyle recommendations from your doctor seem a little bit silly, but it turns out that they really work. And sometimes in cases um, they work just as well as taking your medications. So in addition to your medications, um, we really want you to be building uh, a healthy lifestyle with diet and exercise. And I just wanna say a few words about stress and immune health too, because we've all been living in exceedingly stressful times and we all handle stress um, in very different ways and we're all dealing with different aspects of stress that's going on during the pandemic. Some of us are sick and tired of our family members. Others of us are feeling extremely isolated. So um, I just uh, say this out loud because I think we all should be aware of the stress that we're feeling um, and take note of the impact on our regular healthy habits and what impact that has. Um, we might choose to self-medicate with extra dessert uh, or eat slightly larger portions or have a second glass of wine. We may not be sleeping adequately and we may forego our exercise routine. So I just put the plug in to really be mindful of these things and make sure you're staying on track. Uh, the CDC does have um, some nice resources online. Um, this website is um, probably too long for you to quickly copy down, but is um, on the CDC website. And it's a link to uh, the NIH and has some really nice uh, lectures by physicians and researchers regarding the important role of um, meditation and mindfulness on our immune system. Um, so it turns out there really is some robust data with um, chronic diseases and how the mind-body connection is really powerful. So if you uh, do feel that you're uh, feeling some stress um, from information overload um, or what's going on in the rest of the country, um, I would encourage everybody to take a look at the CDC website. There's really some good resources. So um, I talked, I'm sorry for for quite a while. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bilchek. Hello, everybody. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. Um, Allison, you're going to get rid of the share? I'm trying, yes. Um, I think I've uh, clearly failed on the technology aspect. My apologies. <laughs> There we go, okay. Excellent. So I am not going to present slides. I'm just going to talk as I'm known to do. Um, I just wanna do uh, initially thank uh, Dr. Lee Lewis and Dr. Kelly Hedgepath, uh, my colleagues. Uh, you know, they've been so supportive and, and uh, a strength and, and for many of my patients and our patients and creating these, um, these avenues for teaching and learning and discussion. So thank you so much. And uh, I have to say the Lyon Cardiovascular Group has been uh, around for a long time. It's been 40 to 50 years of existence and we want to remain a viable and relevant uh, group and be accessible to our patients. Um, and I just wanted to thank all of the support staff, uh, all the people who have helped us to make this event available. And apparently I'm talking next week, so I won't give too much away uh, for my talk for next week. So, wow, what a few months, right? So much has changed. We've learned a lot. We have so much to learn. Uh, it's amazing to me how much has been published. And some of this information that comes at us has had 
inadequate review uh, and uh, we, we just see so much information. It's almost information overload, but I've never seen so many people working together to change the outcome. Um, we in the Lown Group have had a privilege of seeing our patients virtually. So we've been invited into your homes, into your offices. Beat the commute. It's also been an opportunity for us to learn so much from our patients and, and uh, the, the creativity, the resilience. And I just want to talk to a couple of things about this virus. Uh, about this pandemic and, and uh, leave a little bit of time for uh, questions because I think that's the most important thing. So COVID-19 is a local, national and truly global pandemic. And dealing effectively with such a crisis requires accurate and consistent messaging and accurate and consistent leadership. Unfortunately, we've had a bit of a dearth in that regard. Where one gets one's information is, is truly important. And you have to recognize that not all the information you read is, is consistent or based on science. And you have to be able to learn to trust where you're getting your information. And sometimes television is not a great way. And the different news channels, it's, it's astounding to me how uh, things have been spun in so many different ways that it's, it's it, it, it's stunning actually, and it's obviously confusing. So um, addressing this catastrophic period on a personal level requires consistency and requires endurance. So one has to think of this virus as a marathon rather than a sprint. So when I've been talking to my patients uh, over the phone or virtually or face-to-face, uh, -face, we talk about several principles and, and one is to be cautious. The other is to be conscientious, to be consistent, and please show compassion. So um, we had an opportunity to, in detail, uh, review, uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis and Hedgepeth for an incredible uh, review. And we now recognize that there's certain vulnerabilities and uh, we need to address those uh, vulnerabilities and the risk factors because they're strongly related to bad outcome from COVID-19. So many of these risk factors, as we reviewed, are modifiable. Uh, you know, obesity, sedentary behaviors, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and, and truly we can and we must, and we must be consistent. Um, I termed the phrase to try flatten the curve rather than to fatten our curve. And um, truly that's, that's something that's important. So, What's also uh, been exposed is healthcare disparities and, and how important socioeconomic factors are, which have amplified the risk of infection and, out, and out adverse outcomes. So that's something we, we need to consistently be aware of. So um, Dr. Hedgepeth reviewed how important it is to be physically active, how we need to be cautious and conscientious about how we fuel ourselves and, and what we eat matters. I've heard so many inspiring and creative stories from our patients, how they've managed through this difficult time. It's given me strength, you know, how people have thrived and yet there are some people who have really struggled and have been crippled. Many of my patients and uh, colleagues and friends have had an opportunity during this time to reflect, to step back, spend some time recognizing what's important, perhaps reprioritize, reconnect. And I really want to reemphasize that, the importance of connection, relationships, figuring how perhaps to physically distance yet socially connect. Everyone's talking about social distancing. I, I really want to emphasize socially connecting but physically distancing. So there's several principles and I'm not going to go through them in too much detail but, uh, because of the time. Um, but the three Ds, distance, dose, and dispersion. So really try to do as much um, as you can outdoors. Open windows, 
important. Wearing masks, important. Keeping that distance is important. Avoiding crowded spaces. And then another term, just be quick. So if you're in an environment where you're feeling vulnerable, try get out of there quickly as possible. Um, so the further you are away from someone who is infected, the less likely you are to be infected. So that's really important. That's the physical distance and that's the major defense from this. Good news that it, it spreads easily, but short periods of contact will not get you infected. So uh, passing someone in the supermarket will not get you infected. Uh, you know, the uh, dose of the virus is important. So the time that you're in contact with someone, you've got to minimize that dose. And that's, that, that makes a huge uh, uh, difference. And uh, wearing masks also helps to minimize the dose that you give to others and the dose you receive from others. Um, so we, there's been a lot of questions and a lot of um, issues related to uh, the aerosolization and the dispersion of the uh, particles in the air and, and you know the small droplets and the bigger droplets and the aerosolization and how long it lasts in the air. But the important principles are if there's movement of air, in other words, if you're in the outdoors, the, the dose and the dispersion uh, uh, change significantly. So particularly if there's a breeze or a wind, so I think it's important to be uh, cautious, conscientious, consistent, but also not be too paranoid where you're isolated and crippled by this and uh, recognize that those three Ds interact. So if you're outdoors and, and distancing and there's dispersion and you're wearing a mask, you're much less likely to be infected. So those are the positive things. I just want to get an, uh, I had a lot more to say, but I really want us to get to some of the questions. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lewis to uh, review some of the questions and each of us will take a turn in, in answering. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for posting questions in the chat. There are amazing, wonderful, lots of questions. I was trying to just in case we ran out of time, type some answers in there. But I think some of these are worth discussing. Um, so there were, you mentioned about the aerosol particles lingering in the air. And I do want to say something about being outdoors versus indoors, which is that six feet indoors is very different than six feet outdoors. Six feet outdoors, the viral particles, whether they're aerosol or droplets, are going to be diluted immediately into the air. There is in an enclosed space, especially a space with a lot of people circulation, six feet is really not far enough. So you've probably all heard the story of the choir practice where nobody hugged or touched because they already knew COVID was out there, but they sang together for an hour in a room and 55 of them or something got sick with COVID. And so singing, shouting, speaking, coughing, sneezing, propels all of these droplets into the air and six feet isn't far enough. So to answer the question that someone asked, if you're in an indoor space and you have to be in a grocery store, definitely wear your mask, definitely consider that to be a higher risk situation. But six feet, you're walking along the reservoir and somebody passes out a mask, probably that's not a very high risk situation. So maybe what we'll do is I'll, we can each take turns picking questions out and keep the questions coming. And so some of them haven't been fully answered. So Allison, do you want to go next, um, addressing some of the questions in the chat? Sure. Um, I do see Dr. Lee Lewis that you responded to some questions about blood type. Yes. And this is um, a really interesting question. So there's been some publications that have demonstrated that the type A blood type uh, is more likely to be associated with severe cases of uh, COVID-19 infection and that um, blood type O um, is less associated with those severe cases. So in these association studies, we don't understand cause and effect. Um, so um, whether the blood type really infers a greater risk or whether that's uh, just tracking with other things that could be confounding that association, we, we don't know. Um, there's been a couple of studies, one of which was published in the New England Journal, the other of which uh, is from 23andMe. Um, and I think future studies are coming. Um, 
that will target the science behind the why, but at this time we don't know. And blood type is something we can't control. So of everything that you have to worry about, that would be one that I would take off the list because I think there's not a whole lot we can do about the blood type that we have. Um, and so, um, except for that, if you're worried, continuing to be um, really uh, cautious, I think is a good idea. Okay. Let's see what else we have. Brian, do you wanna take one? So I got a, a question about uh, going to the gym and exposing yourself in a um, environment where there are, you know, it's a, it's a public space. And uh, this is really an interesting uh, situation. So in Massachusetts, our numbers are so low that uh, it's a very different kind of opening from the rest of the country where the numbers keep surging. And it's truly heartbreaking to me to see what's going on in the rest of the country. But it's also reassuring to know that when people pay attention and do the right thing, how, uh, how the numbers can improve and how we can be much safer. So right now in Massachusetts with the numbers dropping and as low as they are, um, it seems like reopening uh, seems like a good idea. Um, but again, the, uh, the, the same principles of, of the amount of uh, exposure, the dose, the time in an environment, the closeness um, you are to someone else. So certain uh, gyms will uh, take uh, things a little bit differently and, and there's more uh, private gyms where there's less crowds and depending on the demographic and what kind of exercises you are doing. Um, I know outdoor activities seem to me to be so much safer. And if there's an opportunity to exercise outdoors or in a, a private environment, uh, I would strongly recommend and urge that. I think gyms are opening and the, uh, if the right strategies are taken, um, I think, and one wears masks and one cleans equipment, it might be safe. I'm still a little cautious about that. Um, me personally, I'm still avoiding that. I, I need to protect myself. Uh, you know, I need to protect my family and I need to protect, protect my patients and my colleagues. So I'm not willing to do that for myself personally, but um, in the right environment, it's probably safe right now. The other uh, question that has come up is around testing and there's, uh, you know, that's fraught with uh, difficulty and there's uh, different times, types of testing that's available and there's different accuracy of the testing that's available. So there's the testing for the virus, which in some regards are reasonably accurate, but in other uh, environments are not as accurate. And the results currently with some of the testing facilities like Quest are taking five to seven days to get a uh, answer back. So some of the, because there's such a surge nationally, any of the companies that are run nationally uh, and the results are sent out or the, the testing is sent out, um, those are taking a really long time to come back. There's also the quick test, which uh, CVS is offering the minute in the minute clinics and those tests um, are about 70 percent accurate those are the uh, abbott uh, uh, tests you get the results within you know 30 minutes um, so i'm not sure that 30 70 percent accuracy is good enough uh, the Brigham has in-house testing and generally uh, the turnaround time is one to two days. So before you have a procedure in the hospital, there's a requirement that you get tested uh, for COVID-19. And then there's the antibody testing. And, and that's such an interesting subject and, and one can talk about that for an hour in of itself. Um, we just don't know what to do with the results yet. So it's important to study the antibody testing. That's a test that tells you if you've had the virus or being exposed to the virus. So there's two ways the body fights the uh, virus. One is you develop antibodies, but there's another uh, type of uh, 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 another type of response that the body has, and and you have cells which we call killer T cells, which can actually kill the virus. And so why some people have those and are able to kill off the virus and recover quickly and other people who have antibodies. 
Um, so antibodies, I am not sure is helpful for the individual to test. Um, and we're not sure about the accuracy yet, but it is becoming more and more available. And uh, again, we're learning as this data comes out and we're trying to uh, integrate that data and try um, explain it as best as we can. Great. I wanted to talk about a different kind of testing, which is I'm seeing some questions about getting tests done in the hospital. And I have had a lot of patients ask, when is it safe to come in and get my teeth cleaned, hair cut, get my PET scan at the Brigham? So I say the same thing to all my patients and I'll say it here is you have to weigh the risk of the particular exposure with the benefit of that particular test or procedure. So for example, if your nails done, some people don't consider hairdressing optional or elective, uh, but you have to weigh how much you want that done. If it can wait six to 12 months, if it's a teeth cleaning, if it's a haircut, if it's nails, then it makes sense to wait. And then you weigh the risk. So the risk of getting your hair done out in your backyard by someone you know with a mask on, that's low. But the risk of going into a hair salon with a lot of people who are coming going that you don't know that well, that's high. So in that case, you'd say, okay, if I have to go to a hair salon, not gonna happen. But if my hairdresser is willing to come and sit in my backyard with me outdoors, that's worth doing. But then there's other things like medical testing. And for example, we've just reopened our lab recently for medical testing. And I'll tell you that here at our office and at Brigham and Women's and throughout the partner system, we are taking every precaution to make this as safe for you as possible. And that includes minimizing the time that you're here. So as a general rule, waiting rooms are not existing anymore. People wait in their car. Then they come in, get their test done, and they leave. And we apologize, but there's very little chit chat and very little hanging around. The equipment is being sterilized between patients and rooms are being cleaned. And I know that here what we're doing is we're keeping rotating rooms so that there is enough time for aerosol droplets to settle so that we use a different room for one echo and a different room for the next echo. And we're trying not to use the same room too many times. The staff are being screened to make sure that the staff don't have any signs of COVID, although of course there's a tiny chance someone is pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. And we're all wearing protective gear and you are wearing a mask if you come into any healthcare setting. So again, if it's like your mammogram and it's, you know, you've always had normal mammograms and there's no reason to rush into getting it done right now, you could put it off a few months safely if you're doctor thinks that that's fine. But if it's a test that needs to be done for another reason that might impact your management or you're having symptoms that are worrisome, then it's something that you should say, okay, I got to get this done. I'll do it as safely as I can. And my doctor will do it as safely as they can. And let's hope for the best. So it's a case by case basis. And we're happy to talk with you about individual cases. But as far as medical testing, right now in Massachusetts, the cases are so few the hospitals are really organized. We're really organized. It's a pretty low risk situation. I know it's uncomfortable, but to get your blood drawn, to get an echo, to get an EKG, those things are pretty straightforward right now and not particularly high risk. I see some questions about risk factors in there. So maybe I'll jump in and answer some of those. So again, there's a lot we don't understand about these risk factors and how they affect this kind of um, over the top cytokine response that makes um, the mild illness um, progress to severe illness. Um, people in the chat have mentioned um, premature ventricular contractions, which at a low rate are benign and we all have and shouldn't um, be related to a higher risk of having a severe illness. Other people have been asking about atrial fibrillation and about hypertension. So those two in particular are listed on the maybe list from the CDC. And what that means is from these epidemiologic studies that are looking at association, there's been some studies that have said, oh, this is a risk factor, and other studies that have said uh, that it's not a clear risk factor. So I think that there's a lot that we don't know. Um, the same is my plug for optimizing your lifestyle factors. I think um, this is a great time to really make sure for all these chronic conditions that you have everything under control that you can control. 
Um, so there are some people out there, and I don't want to point fingers, that I really have to strong arm. Your blood pressure is higher than I'd like it to be. You're on medication, but you're not at goal. And there's sometimes a resistance to optimize things with medications. If you're one of those people, maybe this would be a, a good time to really readdress that um, with uh, your cardiologist or with your primary care doctor to make sure that everything is really optimized. Um, even when we're not dealing with a pandemic um, and risk, I really encourage all my patients, don't just settle for okay. You really want optimal health. So the factors that we can control, we should really be proactive to control. So if that's your regimen on atrial fibrillation, again, don't settle for just being okay. Make sure your blood pressure is really at target. If it's um, your blood pressure, your weight, your blood sugar with diabetes, let's have a three month plan to really get you on track. So we feel that um, we've controlled as much as we can as you know, we're continuing to collect data and make sure that we uh, identify risk factors going uh, forward. So that's my two cents on that. Other questions? We have time for one more, it's 3.58. Brian, do you wanna pick one more question and wrap us up? Maybe the family stuff. I think the, there's a lot of questions about how to see family safely. Um, well, I think the, the principles are uh, pretty much the same as all kinds of exposure. Again, uh, outdoors is much better than indoors. The length of time is important. So it's the dose, the dispersion and the distance and recognizing uh, that we don't understand everything about it. Those principles become important. But if you're uh, if someone coughs outside and you're walking through their cough, uh, you know, you're not going to get COVID virus from that, especially if they're wearing a mask and you're not wearing a mask. You know, um, there's a whole bunch of um, instructions and advice about, you know, how to exercise safely. And, and uh, there's a community of sports cardiologists, which we're involved with, that help people train and understand the importance of, of all of these principles. But again, uh, whether it's your family, your colleagues, or your work, place, uh, those principles apply. Um, you know, in work settings, there was a question about getting back to work and what, what you know, what does that mean? Um, and how much risk are you? So right now in Massachusetts, the risk's low uh, because the numbers are low and everyone's done their, their, their job. Um, if, the in, if there's an increase, the risks will increase. Uh, but the same principles apply. So uh, paying attention to uh, the number of people, how many people you're exposed to uh, at any one time in, in the, the space. So um, in the, there's a, a lot of information. Actually, Paul Sachs wrote about uh, opening up businesses uh, with, and he did this uh, article in the uh, New England Journal recently, which we can share with people about how to safely open up businesses. And again, it's based on all of these principles that we, we talk about. I just wanted to uh, end off by, again, thanking everyone. This is a great um, you know, venue for us to impart knowledge that we feel being uh, uh, you know, who we are and the, the uh, legacy of the Lyme Cardiovascular Group, that we can be an honest broker and, and a barometer of what's going on in the country without trying to sell snake oil or anything like that. And we will be honest about what the information we understand and know and what we don't know. And I think that that's really important um, because we don't know it all, but we understand the principles. We want to uh, ally ourselves with our patients. Our patients are our greatest asset. So taking care of yourselves is so important to us. Taking care of each other is so important to us. Being consistent, compassionate, uh, caring and cautious, uh, I think is important. And, and that issue of compassion about our, our neighbors, our friends, our family and our colleagues, and uh, even be compassionate towards your doctors, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much for participating.